May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord and our God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ, dear brothers and sisters in Christ. Where there is revelation, there is confession. And where there is confession, there is revelation. The two always go together. You cannot confess what is not revealed, and what is revealed must be confessed. And so it is in the Holy Gospels reading today, Peter confesses what has been revealed to him by the Father. Jesus asks the question with which you are quite familiar. Who do you say that I am? And Peter confesses, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And this confession of Peter's, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, is the rock on which Christ builds his church. The fact that revelation must take place before confession is inherent in the very word of confession, the very definition of that word, confess. For to confess simply does not mean to admit you're wrong, as we confess our sins, as we've done moments ago, to say the wrong that I've done to confess. To confess literally means to say the same thing. And so the church in confessing speaks back to God what God has spoken to us. We say the same thing. For what God says is sure and it is true. And so we hear God's word and as we believe, we speak. We confess who he is, as he has told us. We say this in the Creed, the Nicene, the Athanasian, the Apostles' Creed. We confess who we are, as he has told us in the confession of our sins. We are sinners in need of him, his redemption. We confess his salvation, as he has told us in the liturgy, in the hymns, and the receiving of his gifts in the Holy Supper. And all of this comes from God. Peter does not get credit for answering Jesus and telling him, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, because Peter's answer does not come from within Peter. It comes outside of him. It was revealed to him. And so it must be with the church as well. We do not believe what we choose to believe. We do not speak what we decide that we want to speak. We do not change what is uncomfortable and what we decide that we want to change. Our confession does not come from within us. Our confession comes from outside of us. The great theological term, externos, coming from outside in God speaking his word to us. And that revelation of God to us enables our confession. For as St. Paul said it so well in the reading of the epistle today, who has known the mind of the Lord? Oh, the depths and the riches and the knowledge and the wisdom of God. How unsearchable are his judgments. How inscrutable his ways. And so if God did not reveal himself to us in his word and in the word made flesh, Jesus himself, we would not know him and could not confess him. For as Paul goes on to say in the epistle to Rome, everything is from him and through him and then back to him. And so confessing the truth does not mean speaking our own thoughts, telling of our own opinions, giving our own wisdom, what we think is true, what we hope might be true, what we would like to be true, it is to speak the truth revealed to us by God in his word. To say the same thing. We cannot do otherwise. But we are tempted to do otherwise, aren't we? We sure are. We're tempted to say, and we are tempted not to say the same thing. Tempted not to speak at all. To remain silent. Just keep our mouths shut when it comes to this Christ and the victory in Jesus. 
tempted to doubt and mistrust the very word of God and what God has told us in his word. That what he has told us is not so true, not so sure. That perhaps there are other ways, different ways, better ways. We live in such a pluralistic society, in a pluralistic world. And those are great temptations because our confession of faith is being attacked from every side, from all directions. And quite frankly, some of us find it easier not to confess at all. Sometimes it's much easier that way, isn't it? To just keep our mouths shut, not cause any trouble whatsoever. Just go along with what others are saying, what, with other, what others are doing. For after all, confessing the name of Jesus, confessing our faith in Christ can be very dangerous. It can be dangerous to our friendships. It can be dangerous to our popularity. It can be dangerous maybe even in our jobs. And it can even, in some places, be dangerous to your life. Just consider for a moment the plight of our Christian brothers and sisters in Iraq, in Iran, in Syria, and in Egypt at this very moment. Even young children refusing to renounce their confession in Christ and their baptismal promise are being sliced in two in front of their parents before they, those parents themselves are being put to death. Oh yes, it can be that way and it is. But what does Jesus say about Peter's great confession? Blessed are you. Blessed are you, Simon. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. The blessing that has come to him is to know the truth and to confess the truth, even though it may be very hard, even though it may be very dangerous, even though these things are true. The confession of Christ comes with great blessing. Not the blessings as the, this world considers blessings. Not the wealth and not the riches. Not the receiving of honor and privileges. Those are things that, as Isaiah the prophet said in the reading today, will vanish like smoke and will wear out like a garment. They are here today and they are gone tomorrow. They come and go, those kinds of blessings, with every stock market crash, every dot-com bubble, every housing market collapse, and every political revolution or disaster or tragedy. No, the blessings that come with confessing Jesus Christ transcend and endure all of those things, for they are eternal blessings. Blessings that cannot be taken away from you. Blessings that for now may not be able to be seen, but are a matter of faith and the promise of God. Peter received these blessings. Even though he faced many hardships, even though Peter had many ups and downs like you have many ups and downs, he had doubts and he had difficulties, and even when he, he suffered at the hands of martyrs and martyrdom, those blessings that God gives to Peter those blessings that God gives to his church are blessings that he gives to you as well. For the scripture is true for you. Blessed are you. Blessed are you. This confessing Christ, despite what you may think, despite how you may feel or what may happen to you, you've received a blessing from God. Blessed are you for you are sons and daughters of the living God. Receiving from God what only God can give to you. What those blessings are, Jesus then goes on to describe in specific. Blessings that are, in fact, promises to you. The first is that, on this rock I will build my church. As you confess Jesus Christ as Lord and his work to friends, to neighbors, to family members, you have his promise that he is building his church, not with brick and mortar and rooftops, but building his church, you, the people of the living God, you whom he has loved and he has lived for and died for. You may not see it. You may not know how. It may not seem, though, your confession is doing any good at all. It may not seem that way to you. But again, 
Do not merely rely on what you see and how you feel. Rely on the promise of Jesus Christ. Rely that through your confession, God is building his church, bringing others into it, and keeping you in the safety of his holy church. He is working in the lives of others, and he is working in you through his holy word, through the Holy Spirit, for it's not up to you. It is his work, and he is working. You can count on him. The second promise that Jesus Christ gives with this confession is that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Did you hear that? The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. This means that while the sin and evil in this world may seem quite powerful, and it may seem threatening against the power of Christ and his cross, they cannot prevail. Whatever is threatening you, whatever is tempting you, wherever your faith is being tried, whatever is causing you to doubt, whatever is causing you despair, you are not alone in this fight. You are not on your own, for on your own you cannot stand against the gates of hell. You are not on your own, because the very one who fought for you on the cross, he is the very one who descended victoriously into hell and rose again from the dead. That very one, Jesus Christ our Lord, is with you and fighting for you and defending you. Satan will try to make it look like he's winning and he's prevailing over you. But do not believe his lie. Do not believe his lie. Believe the promise of Jesus Christ to you, for you, through you, and in you. And finally this, last but certainly not least, with the confession of Jesus Christ comes his promise of forgiveness. Forgiveness of our sins. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Through the preaching of the law and the gospel, Jesus Christ is at work, working that we may know that our sins are very serious. Yes, they are, but even more so that we may know that Jesus Christ has granted his forgiveness. The forgiveness won for you by his glorious death and resurrection. The forgiveness that is greater than all your sin. Every sin. The forgiveness that you hear, that is given to you here in this place every time we gather together for the divine service. The forgiveness that is not the word of man, but the powerful and true word of the living God. The forgiveness that is yours by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. The forgiveness for every sinful thought, word, deed, or desire. For your silence when you should have spoken up. For your doubt and for your fear. For your weak desires and for all of your failures. The forgiveness that means we need not be plagued. That we need not be doubtful about or worried about what God thinks of us or if he loves me or not. The cross proves to you that God loves you. The cross proves to you that Jesus loves you. And Jesus' empty tomb proves to you that God's love is not dead, but God's love is alive. And that Jesus promises and that his blessings and that his protection and that his forgiveness are not dead, but they are alive and they are given to you. Blessed are you. And with the revelation of such great and precious promises given to us by Jesus Christ our Savior, we confess. We say the same thing. We acknowledge him and his grace and his goodness toward us. Grace and goodness that we in no way deserve or have earned. And we rejoice to confess this. We rejoice knowing that while our confession may not be welcomed by many in this world, it is needed by all. Needed by all. Needed by those just like us who need to hear that there is a God and a Savior who loves them. The need to know that Jesus died for them and who do not want to be thrown away or to be gotten rid of 
that God wants them and that God loves them and wants to adopt them into his family through holy baptism, forgive them of their sins, and feed them here with his very body given and his blood shed for the forgiveness of their sins and ours. And with the revelation of such great promises by Jesus Christ our Lord, we confess also. Just as St. Paul said, not just by our words, but offering ourselves as living sacrifices. Laying down our very lives for others, not in death, but in living. In living in love, in living in service, in forgiveness, in care, in mercy. In being the voice of those who cannot speak for themselves. Giving of our time, giving of our energy, giving of our material blessings and our abilities to serve those who are truly in need. Not because we have to, but because we can. Because Christ has so loved us. Because Christ has set us free from having to serve ourselves with his service to us. Because the word and the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ transforms you, transforms your way of thinking and your way of life. The scripture said today to us clearly that you are no longer to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That you would be transformed to the image of Christ whom you confess. For from him and through him and to him are all things, your confession and your life. So who do you say that I am? The great question was not just for Peter, but for all the apostles and also for you. And the truth has been revealed to you, the truth of our Savior Jesus, the truth of his death and resurrection for the life of the world, the truth of his promises for the forgiveness of your sins, life, and salvation, that this has been revealed to you is a great blessing, and you are blessed. Now it is time to confess. Time to confess in word and in deed to say the same thing. We simply cannot do otherwise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, guard and protect our hearts and our minds. In Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. And so with Christians around the world, we stand and we confess our Christian faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. Together we confess, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible.